Okie dokie, welcome you guys. So I am trying to get Marissa in here. Um, she is the co-host of this of this live, so bear with me please while I try to get her. All right, Reese, I'm going to add you to the stream. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, hang on one second. All right, cool. All right, cool. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, cool. I'm going to my office. Let me turn off all my other stuff. I got masks. Oh. Right. What is my charger? Charger. All righty. All right. Okay. So, can't post comments. I just want to make sure we are good everywhere. Give me one second. Okay, cool. Uh, navigate. Um, Okay. 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 Awesome. Okay. So let's get started. So first of all, welcome every single one of you. I appreciate you. Um, had a little bit of technical difficulties. I may not use StreamYard moving forward. I'm not sure yet. Um, <laughs> but I appreciate you guys that have been DMing me, um, texting me about Marissa and the information that she provided on Clubhouse. Um, I am humbled. So if you guys are here, please welcome yourselves in the comments. Say where you're where you're coming from. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments. Um, we are about to get down and dirty. Um, and I need to get my drink. Hang on one second, Marissa. Um, okay. Marissa Go ahead and introduce yourself and then I'll come back and do the whole okay. intro. Cool. Hey everyone, um, my name is Reese. So my real name is Marisa Scott. Everyone calls me Reese for short. So uh, I actually met Ty, she reached out to me um, for an opportunity in order to cultivate either some kind of podcast or um, some type of live space where we can talk about building your business, especially when you're new to business, already in it, and um, may need some like restructuring with your business. And then also being able to um, if you are new to it and not have no idea where to start, like giving you the tools that you need in order to at least at minimum get started. I think a lot of times people get nervous or get scared to even jump into business if they don't have a mentor of some sort or just some level of guidance and have no idea where to start. So that's kind of where I come into play. Um, I encountered, I, I am a tax professional, so by trade. So I am licensed in the state of Maryland. So you do have to be certified, take a test background check, all of that in order to be licensed in the state of Maryland. So I do practice in 49 states, New York not being one of them, but if you are someone in New York, I do have two business partners that do as well. Um, outside of taxes, I help with um, entity formation, business organizing, uh, financial assessment. So if you're trying to grow your business, how to get a hold of your finances in order to give you the space in order to do that. Um, and then outside of that, um, I'm a part of entrepreneur, autopreneur, excuse me. So what that means is being able to put cars on a platform to be able to be rented out on apps like Turo or hire car, meaning like people use it for like Uber and Lyft. So, and then now this year, my goal is to break into the Airbnb world. So that basically I'm just trying to find ways to make money while I sleep. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Ty. And 
I see people yeah. from. I know yeah, you. I'm, have to know. Yeah, Philly. I'm trying to like you know multitask and whatnot. <laughs> okay, so welcome, 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 everybody. As y'all know, I normally have a a drink on tap. I get a little nervous, so. First of all, let me introduce myself. You guys do not know who I am. I am called the Abnormal Notary. I do a little bit, I do things differently in the sense of how I come at the notary community. Um, I feel like there's a lot of stigmas on how we should be or how we should not be. And if we should share information, if we sh should not share information. And me personally, I'm going to share as much information as possible. And if they get mad, oh well. <laughs> oh, so, well. <laughs> right. So with that being said, welcome, you guys. Um, I am a loan signing agent. I've been commissioned in the state of New Jersey since May of last year. Over 500 plus signings. I have a fingerprinting business, mobile notary business, inspection. The list goes on, right? Y'all know me. If y'all been in my clubhouses, I don't do titles that well. Um, but I am here to provide you guys information from Reese. And I think I've been killing your name wrong the whole time, haven't I? <laughs> yeah. Haven't I? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about My bad. that uh, clubhouse and I was like, nah, it's cool. I'll just tell her later. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's all good. So I'm going to call you Reese, see? Yeah. So, um, so, yeah so, <laughs> so I met Reese through um, a personal friend of mine, Brittany Adams, be notarized, my sister from another mother. God bless you. Um, she introduced me to Reese. And I am, I'm going to tell you right now, Reese, you and I are going to be friends for lifelong because I'm going to need all kinds of help with my taxes, business planning, Lord willing. Right. Yeah. So with that being <laughs> said, let's get into this thing. Reese, you sent me a PowerPoint presentation. Yes. Yes. So do me a favor because I don't have my other phone with me. Can you I'll resend send it to this? I'm, yeah, I'm going to text you. Resend it to this email and then I'm going to pop it up here. Cool, cool. I'm going to text you. So anyway, well, y'all, as, as we are doing this, if y'all have questions, please start putting them in the comments. I will get to them, every single one of them. I did not have a time frame for this particular meeting because Reese has a lot of information. If you guys were not on the clubhouse that we did, y'all missed out, man. So if you're not on the clubhouse, please follow me. Everything Ty. Reese, what's your handle on clubhouse? Um, It's Queen Reese. Okay. Queen R-E-S. I had to think about it for a second. I was like, um, right. okay. <laughs> is the Outlook email? Yeah. Okay. Okay. It just came through. I just want to make sure. All right. I just recently think you should get it in a second. And just so you guys know, we were trying to figure out like what to call this day. So, um, I know we came up today. It's, it's a soulful, soulful Sunday. So the goal is to kind of, you know, pour into you guys, give you a wealth of information. Um, hopefully you walk away feeling stimulated, motivated, and ready to go on Monday. And then also just to get your gears turned into to ask more questions, honestly. Like as, as a business owner, one of the things, if you're not looking to grow, you're in the wrong line of business, no matter what it is. If you're not looking to learn, if you're not looking to um, perfect your craft, get a different level of expertise, you're in the wrong business. I'm going to tell you right now, you should always be trying to learn and grow and expand, if nothing else, or at least to maintain, um, get the knowledge that you need in order to do that. So I think it's very important that no matter what I tell you guys, like it should just spark certain things in your mind to go ahead and go further, take a step further, especially if you're somebody that procrastinates and sits on things. You know, I've definitely been there, but you know, taken today to kind of fill yourself up today um, and, you know, give you the knowledge and everything that you need in order to get started in your business or grow your business. So that's the goal for today. So we decided to call today Soulful Sunday. Just to give you I guys love it. I love it. So I guess I'm just going to be having all kinds of um, technical difficulties. You sent it, Reese? I just sent it. So I had to find, the, find it first. Well, so I, I just sent it. Yeah, I thought I was um, tripping. Okay. It's just saying that. Okay. Um, okay, you guys. So, so Reese, I know that until I get this, until I get that document come in, can you tell people just how you got started in the taxes and business planning, oh, yeah. um, supporting brown and black people, like just breaking down from the from the from the drama from the yeah, bottom. Absolutely. So, um, I actually have a couple of friends that are in different lines of work than I'm than I am. So, I was just a Put myself in a position to be around people that wanted the same thing I wanted in regards to ownership and leadership and being able to. I think a lot of times when we think of the word entrepreneurship, um, we get swept away with the fact that nobody can tell us what to do. 
and then we write our own paycheck. But at the end of the day, you don't really understand what comes with that. Um, as the saying goes, with, to a lot, uh, what is it? Too much is given, much is required. So it's a lot to be a business owner, honestly. Um, and then I think a lot of times as black and brown people, we're so out of the loop and so out of the game. So the point is to learn the game, master it and apply it to your life and your business and share it with somebody else. Because, you know, we can't get anywhere alone. It's it's a tag team type of business. So I, it was a, like uh, probably like three years ago. I was on social media scrolling, came across a guy's page. His name is Prince Darnell. So that's his name on social media. So Don, I just was watching his videos. He was just real motivational for me. And I knew I wanted to get to another avenue in my life. And so he was advertising about starting a tax business. So for me, I'm a numbers person. So when I sat down and thought about like what I could possibly do, what did I need in order for me to leave my current job? When I tell y'all I was comfortable at my job, I was comfortable. Baby, I was getting a stipend. I was working at the Palm. They was feeding me good. <laughs> I had really good co-working environment. Like I, it, Nothing was stressful wow. for me. Like I woke up and went to work with no problem, rode the train. I was right by happy hour, like everything I needed. <laughs> but I knew exactly that this wasn't my calling. Like I got comfortable and then I got to a stagnant point and I was like, this is not it. So I ended up hitting him up. We were supposed to be on a 15 minute call and turned into two hours of me talking to him. And so then I was like, yeah, I'm about to do it. So instead of me, I sacrificed buying myself a car and put that money into starting that business. So then I knew it was going to be a lot of sleepless nights. So I literally used to wake up four o'clock in the morning. I used to do lift from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., ride the train, go to work from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., get off, get to my car about six o'clock and then Uber and Lyft to nine o'clock at night. Because I knew that in order for me to keep my nine to five to pay my bills, but also create a savings account for myself, for me to leave my job, there was no days off. So I did that right. seven days a week. And then um, from there, once I started the business, uh, I prayed for an opportunity for me to leave my job, a, a sign, basically. My job ended up telling me that they were moving to Orlando. And I was like, nah, I ain't about to go down here. I just what? got back. Yes. I was like, I ain't <laughs> So That's Don crazy. come to Philly. He was like, can you come to Philly? And I was like, yeah. Came to Philly, made more money in four months than I ever seen in a year. Wow. It blew wow. my mind. And I was like, oh. I literally had $32 in my bank account, y'all. What? <laughs> yeah, $32 when I moved to Philly. <laughs> I had no money. Oh, that's crazy. That's so crazy. I ended up learning a lot from him about marketing and uh, marketing yeah. your business content and that kind of thing. And then his mom had been doing taxes for 15 years. I had been doing it for a few years for family and friends, but she had did it in a corporate environment. So mm. I picked her brain and started being around people that cultivated what I wanted for myself and what I saw. So if you were in the direction I was heading, I was picking your brain on a constant basis and just doing my own research. And once I, once tax season was over, I had all this money and I was like, okay, what can I do to make this? I shouldn't be able to just do this. So right. then I started to listen to other podcasts and individuals that talked about scaling that money and using yeah. it in the platform. So that's what led me to open an auto business that I have. And then now I just started an LLC about two or three months ago. For it's called luxury connoisseur. So basically, I feel as though black and brown people, when people think of us, they don't think of luxury, which is BS. Um, like we are luxury, like we are what people want. So I feel as though anything that touches my body or I use <clears throat> in the sense of my space needs to be luxury and people need to pay me to use it. Um, so that's where the direction I'm pushing towards for myself, and then also opening like rental properties and Airbnbs to cultivate a whole nother source of income. Listen, I think real estate is everything. I'm a real estate investor as well. Um, I think with the whole COVID-19 situation, it's opened up a lot of doors, especially mm -hmm. being from Louisville. Shout out yeah. to Louisville, Kentucky. Um, they have property selling for like 10000 right now. Like, it's crazy. Yes. So, I, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So listen, this is what we're going to do. I see you have a shirt on, and then we're going to rock out. I want to see your shirt, because I got a shirt, too. <laughs> So cool. this is my partner company, uh, DAR Tax and Financial Services. Yeah. So on social media is DAR underscore tax. So it's me and my okay. two business partners um, from last year in Philly. We opened our own uh, location this year. So we were so yeah. proud of that. So it was super nice. dope. Okay, so we're like a one-stop shop. So whatever All I right, do, that's what you see. Know your words. 
And then add tax. Add tax. Yes, honey. Yes. Y'all better clap for her. <laughs> well, it was one that on social media that said, um, know your worth, add tax. And then yeah. all the multiple. It was it wasn't like this long calculation. And I was like, besides the tax, like add all the other crap, the interest. I was like, oh, all, all of it. <laughs> so let's do this thing. So um let's get into your presentation. Okay. Uh, and let's go through and let's just start dropping gems so people can get out a pen and paper. Um, yes, yes, yes. Definitely get a pen and paper because it's gonna be a wealth of information that we're gonna go over. Right. Um, so I wanna make sure you guys, you know, keep, you know, write the information down, but then also if you have questions, write your question down or put it in the box so that we can at least address it at the end. So nobody's overlooking. All right. Cool. You know, getting this, used to is this session being recorded. Um, what happened? Somebody asked, is this session being recorded? Yeah, so good question. So all of the videos that are being recorded will be uploaded to my um, YouTube channel. So just like the online uh, notary taxes or online brunch and notary taxes, that's on my YouTube page. Like I said, y'all, I'm getting new to this whole thing. So I'm kind of just trying to figure it all out. So um, as I get better, um, information will get better. Hopefully it answer your question. So it'll be up on my YouTube page once this is done. Uh, let's see here. Give me one second. All right, what do you see? Uh, you're just sharing your screen. So we see this background here. All right. Like I'm in a different area today. So I'm like, <laughs> not in my same place. <laughs> What happened? Yeah, I, like all my, like everything is, you know. Can you still see my screen or no? Yeah, definitely can. You see the PowerPoint? Not yet. All right. It's a black screen. Hang on. It's open in another, in another window. Yeah, let me see. Hang on. I think I'm going to stop using StreamYard, like straight up. Does this let me? It says I can share my screen. Yeah, see, when I did oh, the online dress last night, Sue Hope couldn't do it. Can you Got see it, it now? Yeah. Okay, cool. We already went through this, right? Who you are? Mm-hmm. And I can't put it in a PowerPoint because it's it came over as a PDF. So we'll just rock out here. It? What happened? Does it let you show a full screen? Nah. Okay, that's cool. We're going to rock out what it is. Yeah. Okay. So what is an entrepreneur? I think this is very important. So one of the things uh, in my life right now, I'm very big on words. Words have meaning. Understanding them, not just saying them, but having a deep rooted understanding of what you're saying. So there's a, a business owner and then there's an entrepreneur. So an entrepreneur is an individual who undertakes the risk associated with creating, organizing, and owning a business. So it's very, very important. A lot of times I hear people say like, oh, I want to quit my nine to five and work for myself. But a lot of times we don't understand what comes with that. Like if you if you just think about the daily day operation of you going to some a place of employment, they already have operating agreement in place. They already have a schedule. They're already telling you what to do from nine to 10, from 10 to 11, 11 to 12. You have to be that person. You have to be HR. You have to be the CEO. You have to be customer service. You know, you have to be everything to your business that a corporation only provides with multiple departments. So right. I think it's very um, important that we understand that before, you know, just diving straight into it. Um, but you can look at that slide. All right. This so is what I want to touch on. So I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let you run. Yeah. So structuring your business. This is very, very important. I'm gonna pull up this um, PowerPoint two. Wait, where'd my screen go? So there's five different ways that you can structure your business. Um, and a lot of times people, when they initially start, they start first by doing a, uh, so as a sole proprietor. So I wanted again to touch on what the definition of each one is. So if you are not able to see her screen, just so you know, a sole proprietor is unincorporated business owned and run by one individual with no distinction between the business and you, the owner. A lot of times people get LLCs and other businesses because they want to have a level of separation. Now, I get people that ask me all the time, like, if I first start my business, like, do I have to go ahead and jump into an LLC? Right. Not yes. times I can. No. So just because you do not have an LLC yet or an S Corp yet, you know, or any other business structure yet does not mean it's not a business. So I want you guys to make sure you understand that. 
what happens is if you start a business, as long as you're able to keep track of your income and expenses, it still can be um, put on your tax return as a Schedule C. Um, so that's basically right on your personal tax return. It's just another schedule included outside of the Form 1040. With the Schedule C, basically, instead of it having like your business information on there, like your business name and your EIN number, for example, it will just say your name, your social, and then the, the network in, in which your business operates. So if you were a chef, it would go under like catering. If you were an Uber driver, it would go under taxi services. Basically, that's how it would show up on your tax return. So you don't necessarily have to already have been an established business under one of the entities in order to claim it on your taxes. So um, and another false or assumption that people tend to have is that um, if I haven't made any money my first year, but I've invested in parts of my business, I'm not I probably can't even put it on my taxes. That is not true. You do not have to have an income yet in order to add your business to your tax return. Nine times out of 10, you have paid money to start your business. So whether it was take a class, get certified in something, buy materials for your business. And if you have conducted business, but you haven't reaped any benefits, um, any of the fruits of your labor yet, it is still able to be added. The deductions are still able to be added to your tax return on a Schedule C. So the most popular one is the second one, which is an LLC. So what that is, is a limited liability company, which is a business structure, which keeps the owner and the business completely separate. So basically, when you have your LLC and it is established, it's a barrier between your personal assets and your business assets. So what that means is if you start to build up your business, um, if, if anything were to happen, God forbid, if you were sued, for example, this is another thing a lot of times people don't think about, and I'll go into that a little bit later, but if you get sued for any reason, if you lose that lawsuit for any reason, they're able to come after you if your business is not separated from your personal. So if you were solely a sole proprietor and got sued, they can come after your house, your car, yep. your bank accounts, any assets that you acquire and take it. If you lose that, you know, if you lose that battle, if you have an LLC and it's protected, if you have insurance, your insurance will cover the loss of the damages and you pay the deductible. If you don't have insurance, and unfortunately it could possibly bankrupt you depending on how much money it is, but guess what? That's your business. Your personal is still intact. You still got your house, you still got your car, you still got your bank accounts. They only are able to come after your business assets. And if that happens, I don't want people to, I've seen people, so what? You Corporations do it all the time. They go bankrupt and keep it pushing. So if you keep lose, it pushing without no problem. They ain't got no problem. So what, if this got dissolved, open another LLC and then do your business under the new LLC. Like, and there's no limit, please, not to interrupt your thought process. There's no limit on to how many LLCs one can open, correct? That is correct. Uh -huh. Especially in real estate. You know how people like will do the, um, I forgot the actual term, but like, yep, <laughs> buying property so that you can do quick flips. Like you buy the, uh, yeah. I forgot the term for it, but yeah, it's man, people do that real yep. estate. Yep. Okay. But, um, so LLCs are basically the most popular for most business owners. Um, and then the next one is a multi-member LLC. So let's say, for instance, you and your partner decided you wanted to go into business together. So you can do a multi-member. So it's just a limited liability company with a minimum of two members or more. So if you have multiple business um, partners, that's what a multi-member one is. Then the other one is an S-Corp. So this is one that's kind of toggled between because... Some people are afraid because they don't understand how it works and how it can benefit them. So with the S Corp, what that is, is it's a corporation that elects to pass corporate income, losses, deductions and credits through their share through to their shareholders for federal tax purposes. So what does that mean exactly? So basically, when you are an LLC, a single member LLC, as well as an S Corp, it is a pass through entity. The income is passing you and onto your business. So basically, it's not just reported here. So a lot of people um, initially start with an LLC. You can have an LLC, but you can ask to be taxed other than an LLC. If you are a single member LLC, you are taxed like a sole proprietor. The only difference is your assets are protected. That's the difference between the two. Now, Reese, tell people, because the question that I have that we had on Clubhouse, right, regarding S-Corp. Mm -hmm. There has to be a certain threshold that you have to be into in order actually to do an S-Corp. Is that correct? Yeah. A certain amount correct. of revenue that you have made in that rear. Okay. Can you talk about that? Yep. 
So basically, it's going to be in the slide later on, too. So if you um, are a visual person, you, you'll see it when I when she goes further down later. But when you start an S-Corp, um, a lot of people will initially start their business and then try to go straight into it. Wait till you generate at least $50,000 or more. The reason is because the point of the S-Corp is so that you're not paying taxes on all of the income that your company has made. When you're an LLC, you pay on all of the money that you you pay taxes, excuse me, on all of the money that your uh, company has generated in revenue. When you are an S corp, there is a separation between your business income and then what you pay yourself on payroll. And you have to be on payroll legally if you're going to be an S corp. So let's just say if you finally made the threshold and you're making sixty thousand dollars in your business and you decide to put yourself on payroll, meaning you are a W-2 employee to your company and give yourself 30,000, then you'll have 30,000 still left in your business. That 30,000 is not subject to employment tax. The 30,000 you pay yourself, just like when you were working a nine to five, you know, your social security will come out of that, um, your state and federal taxes and FICA will come out of that. So it's just like a regular job, but instead, instead of a, a company other than yourself paying you, it's your company. But you can always get a payroll company to set that up for you, like things like Surebill or ADP, you know, put yourself on payroll and they will literally handle all the paperwork for you. And you just pay a monthly fee. Like I think my coworker, she pay, um, I say coworker, my business partner, she paid $35 and she's on payroll for herself. And it's worth it because they file all of your federal tax income information, state tax information. They send everything to Social Security. Like they handle literally everything for you. And then at the end of the year, when it's time to send out W-2s, they'll send you a copy of your W-2. So, but in order to go to that route, I recommend 50,000. It's not a requirement, but it wouldn't make sense less than that. And then the last entity is a C-Corp. So of course, these are more like uh, your Walmarts, your Best Buys and that kind of thing. But it's a legal structure for a corporation in which the owners or shareholders are taxed separately from the entity. So I don't have a lot of clients that go into C Corp, but I have a lot of clients that are either LLC, multi-member LLCs or tax as an S Corp. So those are the structuring. So the first thing of course you wanna understand is what different structures are available to you for your business. Once you have a clear understanding of the pros and cons of each, it, makes it that much easier for you to make a decision on what route is smart based on the type of business you run. Right. So you can, this is all right. have a question. Yeah. So this, yeah, yeah. I have, there's one question and then I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the LLC because yeah, I see ahead. a lot of, yeah. So I see a lot of loan signing agents, um, notary publics that come out the gate that says, Hey, should I get an LLC? Should I, should I do an S corp? Should I do a C corp? Like, I don't even know which business entity I should do. This is what I tell people. Mm -hmm. If you're first starting a notary, if you're becoming a notary or a loan signing agent, do not invest the money, in my humble opinion, mm -hmm. don't invest the money if you don't know if you're going to be doing it for longevity. If you don't know if you're going to be in the business long term, don't waste mm -hmm. your money up front until you know, okay, yep, I know if my return on investment, I can build a business, I can build an empire, whatever you're choosing to do. Personally, mm -hmm. I wouldn't open up an LMC until it was until I knew for sure. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? That's smart. No, I think that's smart because I have some business owners that like, for example, I have one guy, he was a chef two years ago. Um, and then he just knew he wanted to do that full time. Like people used to come to this restaurant and ask for him. Like, if he, is he cooking today? I'm not eating here. And then where he, whoever he decided to like, move to other, yeah. people went with this guy. And I tell you, his food is like crazy. Amazing. So he, and he was like self-taught. Self -taught. So he wanted nice. to open up, um, you know how they do like the meals? He wanted to start small yeah. just to see how much he could do. So he yeah. was just scared to do that. I say, if you're not 100% sure this is the route that you're going to go, mm -hmm. just do it as a sole proprietor your first year. Because then you'll I be like able that. to manage your deductibles. Um, yeah. you, you pay a little bit higher in taxes, but at least it's a trial and error. You know whether or not this is what you really want to do. And then you'll see what it takes to really be a business owner. So after that first yes. year, he went in and got his LLC um, and he's taxed as an S corp. So, yeah, that's you know, I, I agree. I think that's good. That's awesome. I, okay, so this is what I got, Reese. I got one question from Polite Choice. So the question is, can you change from one entity to the other at any time with no penalty or loss? There's no penalty, but there could be a loss. So when I say there's no penalty, so you say, for instance, you start off um, as a sole proprietor. So the first thing you get 
um, is an EIN number. So you get an EIN number, and with that EIN number, you can stay right on that page. With that EIN number, that's established with your business. They'll ask you, are you a sole proprietor? Are you a LLC? Are you an S corp? They'll ask you whatever your entity status is. So let's just say you started as a sole proprietor. Okay, that's cool. But whenever you decided, hey, you know what? I actually want to be an LLC. If your name is not exactly the same as the LLC, they'll make you get a brand new EIN number. And the reason that can become an issue is if you've established I business credit that. under the EIN. I didn't know that. Yeah, so let's say it's um, Thai Notary Services and you started off as a sole proprietor. Then a year from now, you're like, you know what? I'm going to get my LLC. Your LLC has to say Thai Notary Services LLC in order for them to allow you to keep the EIN number and just change the entity under it. If the name is any different, they will not let you do it. You'll have to get a brand so new EIN. So basically, you're 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 putting like a label on top of another label in order yep. to incorporate yourself as an LLC. Okay, I got it. But um, okay. if you decide that um, you want to change your name completely, and you'll have to get a new EIN number, and if you have established business credit under the old EIN number, it can kind of put you at a start over phase. Meaning like this new EIN number, you can't transfer business credits from one EIN to another. It's just like a social. You got to start from the ground up. Right. That's the only thing okay. in one of your a loss, but there's no penalty. You just, it's a form you fill out to the IRS. Awesome. Nice question, polite choice. All right, Reese, let's rock. So the next one is um, LLC structuring. So the reason I, I only chose two to talk about because these are the, mo the more I see the LLC as well as the um, S Corp structuring. So with this slide, this one is more so talking about LLC structuring. So an LLC provides asset protection. This creates a veil because the LLC acts as its own entity. Again, a separation between your personal assets and your business assets. When it comes to taxation, you are taxed as a pass-through entity. So basically, any income that you make under this LLC, they will tax you the same as a sole proprietor because you're not on payroll. So basically, all of your income is taxed. Okay. And then you, even though you choose to be an LLC as your status, you can elect for to be taxed as a multi-member LLC, an S Corp or a C Corp. So even though you have your EIN under the LLC, they'll ask you how you want to be taxed. So you can just put as an LLC, which they'll treat you as a sole proprietor. Or if you um, made the decision, okay, I want to be an S Corp, you can go ahead and elect that. Let's say that you are not sure, but like two years down the line that you decide, I don't, I'm, I'm making enough money. I don't want to be taxed as an LLC or sole proprietor anymore. You can submit a request to change how you're taxed. Now, you do have to do it. I think it's the third. You have to do about, it's either the 31st or the third, but you have to do it by March of that fiscal year. So whatever changes, if you make it after that, then it won't go into effect until next year. So just know that in my, keep in mind, if you ever want to make any entity status changes in regards to how you are taxed as a business owner, you have to do it by March 3rd of whatever that year is. Otherwise, they'll tell you it'll be in effect next year. And they'll send you a, you know, a, what is it, a confirmation letter in the mail to let you so know. You have to, so, so if you want to change, you're saying the entity? No, change how you're taxed as a business owner. Okay, so, so you have to do that before March 3rd. Yep. So you can okay. be an LLC. And if you decided when you first started, you were okay with being taxed as that. But later on, you make enough money now, you make more than 50000 and you're like, all right, I want to go ahead and be taxed as an S-Corp. There's a letter, I mean, a form, excuse me, that you submit to the department that handles EIN. And then they'll let you know, like, you have to do it before March in order for it to go into effect for that calendar year. Otherwise, they'll, the letter will say the next year. Okay. Makes sense. So um, with being an LLC, you are responsible for paying 15.3% in self-employment tax, as well as state and federal tax. So this is the not so fun part <laughs> of being an LLC. So if you can look at the bottom, it says the examples. So I, I function better with examples. So if you scroll down to the next one, so this is the um, chart that I created to kind of, I'm a visual person. So Let's just say in your LLC business, you um, have a net profit of $100,000, right? So the first thing you're paying is self-employment tax at a rate of 15.3%. So if I make $100,000, I'm paying $15,300 
just in self-employment tax to the IRS. Then outside of that, now you have to pay state and federal income tax on the 100000 So because of the tax bracket that you're in, you're taxed at a higher rate. So the percentage that we tell people to stay within is um, 15, excuse me, 18 to 20%. So what that means is as you make money with your business, I always tell people the first year, you're not expected to make estimated tax payments. Normally like the first, it can be anywhere from one to five years, depending on how much you're making in your business, but you're not expected to do estimated taxes. But as you grow in revenue, you want to start making those payments. So you're not getting a huge tax bill at the end of the year. But if you're someone that's not comfortable paying estimated tax payments, what I do is put my clients on a tax plan. So once a month, we evaluate how much revenue your company has made. And from that revenue, you have a savings account that has a high interest yield. So, OK, I made $10,000 this this month in my business. I'm going to take 20 percent of that and put it into the savings account so that when the IRS come knocking at the end of the year, I got I got a way to write a check. I'm not worried about like, oh, how I'm gonna come up with this money or get on a payment plan, which incurs interest and late fees. No. So if you make a hundred thousand, the first thing you're paying is self-employment tax, which is the fifteen thousand three hundred, and then a roughly uh, roughly eighteen to twenty percent in state and federal tax. So now, after the taxes have been taken out, you went from making a hundred thousand dollars to an adjusted income of sixty four thousand seven hundred, which is not a little bit of money. <laughs> So, so I have a question. This, this, because I'm gonna tell you right now. When I see numbers, I go stupid. That's probably not the right terminology, but I see numbers as just like I can't even think of the word. But it looks crazy to me, and it doesn't make yeah. sense. So when I look at this this chart here, when you say negative fifteen point three percent self employment tax, like can you break that down? Is that yeah. a number you just picked up, or is that a number that's from the IRS yeah. or? Okay. Yeah. So that's from the IRS directly. The one that's okay. kind of varies is your state and federal because the federal is the federal. No matter what, you know where state you live in, your federal tax is just what it is. It's based on your tax bracket, but your state taxes very differently in each state. Like how much I pay in taxes in Maryland is not what you would be paying the taxes in Jersey. You know what I'm saying? So that's why we tell people percentage wise, it can be anywhere from like 15 to 20 percent that you want to put to the side. So the 15.3 percent is from the IRS, that is their number. So when you are self-employed and you are a sole proprietor or single member LLC, and you do not elect to be taxed any differently, you have to pay a self-employment tax. So basically in order for you to be in business for yourself, there's a tax in order to do that. <laughs> so the self-employment tax rate is 15.3% right now. So if you make $100,000 in your business, yeah, they get 15, Fifteen thousand three hundred dollars in that. They're doing what though? But what are they doing? What are they doing with that money? I could, <laughs> I could tell you. I would let her know myself because I was funny. I ended up googling it, and I was like, "What? What is this for? Right, how are you saving my money? I don't understand." <laughs> so, okay. it, made, it made me think about um, corporations. So corporations pay tax. So just like when you go to it in your nine to five, you're paying. Self-employment, I mean, that's self-employment, excuse me. You're paying state and federal taxes, your social security, all yes. of that stuff. Your company is paying the quote unquote self-employment tax. You're not. It's because uh, you are being expected to be an LLC and tax as a sole proprietor, you're paying that both. Makes sense. So that makes sense. Okay. That so makes you, sense. You are the business and you're also the employee. So you're you're you have dual roles at the end of the day. Yep, exactly. Okay. All right, and so we have some questions for you. All know, no, no, go ahead. We all know what, uh, you know, state and federal taxes are because we've worked regular jobs, so we see that on our paychecks. So that's that just varies depending on, one, your tax bracket, and then, two, um, your state, because it varies every year, too. It can go up or down. So basically, okay. in this scenario, you are an LLC provide, um, excuse me, a single-member LLC, and you're taxed as a sole proprietor. And if you hundred made a hundred thousand dollars based on what the current tax table is, you're basically walking away with roughly sixty five thousand of that money. So does the tax table um, change? Yeah, every year they update it. So they update it uh, at the end of every fiscal year. So when um, they go and Congress and them go to review like laws and changes and stuff like that, they mm -hmm. will send it uh, um, that to the IRS, and the IRS will determine if any percentages need to change. 
So question me as a as a LLC, because I have an LLC. How mm -hmm. do I know that that self-employment tax has changed? Do I get notified? Do I have to call somebody? Do I need to have a business planner? How do I know what my self-employment tax will be next year? Yeah, they don't tell you. <laughs> Your tax professional knows because we actually get notifications from the IRS for any like major changes. Uh, and then sometimes if it's too major of a change to implement like immediately in the next tax year, they'll wait till another year to give people time to adjust to the inflation. Um, that's what they did when Trump made changes in 2017. It was mm -hmm. supposed to go in effect in 2018. He, they waited another year and did 2019 because it was like so huge of a vast change and the IRS couldn't keep up with the changes that Congress made. So basically yeah. a lot of times it's not the IRS that <laughs> make these wild changes, it's Congress. And then it's up to them to figure out- They just the implement it. Right, and how to, okay. Yep. Got you. So, so we have a lot of questions, that, yeah. which I am, that's freaking awesome. So Reese, it's really up to you if you want to finish your PowerPoint, then we come back to the end of the questions or we can rock the questions right now. You let me know. Uh, we can go through the rest and then, cause some of it might answer itself. And if not, then absolutely, I'm willing to go back and okay. hear anything. Awesome. So everybody that has commented, we're going to roll through the PowerPoint and then we'll come back. Okay. So I appreciate you. All right. So if you go down to the next slide, so we're, yep. what we're going to talk about now is like the benefits of having an LLC. So one of the benefits is structural separation between your business and your personal assets, like we discussed. Your personal assets, such as like your home, your bank accounts, um, any other other debts cannot be absolved because of any business debts that you incur. So like I was saying before, if you get sued or anything or that business goes under because you just can't maintain it, it's absolutely OK. You start over from scratch. There's no harm, no foul. So um, you can basically move on and start another LLC from scratch and attach that to whatever you're doing. So the second one in the middle is less paperwork compared to owning an S Corp or a C Corp. There are more requirements and rules that have to be met when paying yourself and being in regulation. So people will love to see that they can save money as an S Corp, but make it be clear. It is a, a lot of rules and regulations to being an S Corp, being taxed as an S Corp. It's very important that you have a payroll company. It's very important that you have a tax um, pre preparer or planner. But like if you're okay with doing taxes on your own and you're savvy, still have a tax, a tax professional that helps you plan for your business throughout the year. Um, this is very important because if you get fined, the fines can go anywhere from $50,000 all the way up to $200,000. And a lot of times as small business owners, we don't have the money to cover something like that. And you don't want your business to become insolvable. So it's very important that before you make that jump into, you know, being taxed as an S Corp, you understand what comes along with that. So and then the other benefit of having an LLC is you are taxed as a pass through entity and elect how you want to be taxed. So with the LLC, you have a little bit more flexibility. That's the good thing about it. That's why a lot of people love it. Um, and then you are able to write off and deduct business related expenses, which can lower your tax liability. So with an escort, you don't get that same level of flexibility. That's the one good thing people love about being in an LLC. Yes, you do pay a little bit more in taxes, but you have a little bit more wiggle room when it comes to, excuse me, having an escort. I mean, when it comes to having a business and you have certain deductions and expenses that you want to account for to offset your income. And not only that, you can pick and choose. That's another good thing about it. Um, so let's just say, for instance, you're in the process of trying to buy a house, right? So being a homeowner, um, the lenders require you to have at least two years of experience in your business in regards to tax returns, showing income for two years in that business before they feel comfortable giving you money for a home. So when you do that, the good thing is the flexibility is you can pick and choose how much of the deductions you want to add. So let's say you know what, I need to qualify for a $250,000 house. In order for me to qualify for that, they say that I need to make $75,000 on paper in business. If you ever have a copy of your um, tax return, look at your Schedule C. Go down to line 31. If you are in the negative, that means that your business took a loss that year. If you're at zero, that means your business didn't make any money. And then, of course, anything over that shows that you are profitable. So if you made $125,000 in that business and you only need to show $75,000 worth of income to qualify for that home, but let's say you have way more deductions than that, you can roll over your deductions to the next year. 
So if you don't want to claim all of them, you want to just put enough to put you in the tax bracket that you need to be in order to qualify for that home, but also not be paying out the wazoo to the IRS. You That's why you have a tax professional to help you kind of navigate and be right in the middle where you need to be. And then once you get that home, and if you're not looking to acquire any other assets, next year we can roll all of that um, deductions right on. And then next year you can take a loss with your business. So there's so many different ways when an LLC that you can kind of play with money and um, not owe out the out the wazoo, or if you want to owe, just so you can on paper qualify for other things in your life. That's why you got a tax professional to help you do that. So that's one of the other benefits. Um, you can go down to the next slide. Okay, token. So these are five deductions like that are so pivotal and important when you were having an LLC, especially now that we are in COVID. Like um, a lot of people had to learn how to run their business from home. So these are some deductions, like if you haven't already spoken to your tax professional, you might want to bring it to their attention that you want them to look into this for you. So home office deduction. So you can do, there's two different methods that you can do with the home office deduction. So you can do the smileys method, which is $5 for every, I mean, excuse for up to 300 square feet. So basically every 300 square foot is a $5 deduction on your tax return. I personally um, use the actual expense method with my clients. So with the actual expense method, this is where you deduct the actual expenses resulting from your home office. So what does that mean? Let's say, for instance, now you are uh, you don't have a brick and mortar or you're not working in an office anymore in your home. You need Internet to run your business. You need electricity to run your business. So expenses that you accrue from having to work at home, those become deductible to, to a certain extent, depending on how much space you have for your office. So basically knowing your square footage providing that to your tax professional, then a certain percentage of your bill is tax deductible. So of course, if you're working in an office, like to, like your actual office um, brick and mortar still, of course, 100% of your internet service is deductible. But if you're at home, only a certain percentage of it, but it's still tax deductible, you want to write off as much as you can. If you're paying $100 in internet service and you're able to get 50% off, that's $50 over 12 months. That's a deduction. So that's one of them. The, the other one is office supplies. So track all of your supplies you utilize to run your business. These include things like your software, pens, pencil, paper. You want to keep a log of that information so that when it's time to come and do your taxes, that's a deduction for your office supplies. Now, the travel and education, this one is really big because it was a lot of people that even though they were at home, they were paying for like um, online school services or um, travel to areas that were, you know, COVID, like had COVID restrictions in place so that they can come to webinars and seminars and, and learn. So travel and education expenses. So conferences, webinars, events, classes, basically anything to further your education is tax deductible. And it traveling included. So your flight, to the location, the hotel, if you had to get a rental car or Uber to get around, your meals. So for this year, they're actually 100% deductible, whereas normally they're only 50%. So if you had to do like business dinner, lunches or breakfasts, um, conduct business that kind of way, 100% of it is tax deductible. So that's very important. Um, the other one is your cell phone service as well as your cell phone. So deduct the cell phone itself and the monthly plan. You can only deduct the percentage of usage if it's like personal. So let's say, for instance, you only have one phone and then you use that phone for personal calls and business calls. It's only 50 percent. But if you can afford to buy a whole separate phone under your plan and um, for your business line only, all of that is tax deductible. How much you pay for the phone is 100 percent deductible and 100 percent of your monthly plan is deductible. So if you can't afford to do both, do it. If not, that's fine. You still get 50% off your, your bill. And then this one, the last one I, I, is mileage deduction. This is very important for mobile notaries. So the standard mileage deduction or the actual expense. So what I always have my clients do is download like things like Mile IQ, for example, and to keep track of their mileage while they're traveling to and from the businesses and conducting business because that expense is tax deductible. You put in how much mileage the system will calculate based on what the per, the cents are per year. I think it's like 58 cents this year. I have to double check. But 
that's deductible too. Gas receipts are deductible too. So it's important that you keep track of those things to provide to your tax professional so that you can get credit for those things and that money's going back in your pocket because these are things that are used to run your business. So I have a question real quick because I know that mm -hmm. on Clubhouse, on Clubhouse we had talked to Phil and we were talking about square footages of your offices and how certain mm -hmm. sections of your office may be used for personal or whatever. Yeah. Can you talk about that if someone wanted to use their bedroom, for instance, as an office? Could okay. They so, that? Yep. That about to say that's the thing. There are certain limitations into what space that you can use for your office space. I had a client that asked me if she she said she'd be in her bathroom because her kids be all over the day on place. <laughs> She said, I literally sit in my bathroom and I do, do business. I said, we can't do that. <laughs> so certain places are off limits. Like you can't do it in right. <laughs> there. So like um, bedrooms, I have to double check. I think they said, I could have sworn I read, I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to follow up. But uh, originally bedrooms were off limits, bathroom were off limits, and kitchens were off limits. So you had to find okay. another space. And then also it couldn't be a dual space. So basically, well, uh, I, they can't be my exercise room and it can't be my office at the same time. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So they did make some uh, flexibility with the COVID changes. So they were a little yeah. bit more flexible with people because people had to go home. And then statewide, people were, weren't even able to go to their brick and mortars if you had it. So right. they actually right. opened up a lot of the rules and regulations, but bathrooms are still off limits. Kitchens are still off limits. So I have a question before we go to your next slide, which is pros and cons of escort. So in the beginning, I talked about the LLC, right? Making sure mm -hmm. that if the business that you want to be in for longevity is what you want to do. The question that I have is, if you don't have an LLC and I'm a new loan signing agent, can I still tax exempt? Can I still do deductions for toner, paper, all of yep. that? Or do I have to have an LLC to be able to do those tax deductions? Nope. So you can be any entity status. So sole proprietor, LLC, S Corp, C Corp, and claim deductions in regards to your business. So even if you are a sole proprietor and just getting your feet wet, still keep track of those expenses because it will still go on the um, Schedule C. It'll just be attached to your social security number and not your EIN number. That's literally the only difference between the two. And what is a Schedule C? So a Schedule C, um, if you ever, um, if you, if this is not your like first year um, going into business, or if it is your first year, let me just say, if it is your first year, basically when you do your tax return, depending on what type of, um, income or wages or interest that you have to report. There's a, a it's a form that's submitted to the, the IRS for any um, deductions, expenses, or uh, business income. So it's called the what's the actual title of it? Profit and loss for your business. So a Schedule C. If you're looking through your tax return on the right hand side to next to the Schedule C, it says profit and loss business. For, profit and loss for your business. So it has like your your, your personal name to the right, it'll have your social or your company's EIN number. Below that, it'll have the address and then the line of work that you are in. And then below that, it'll start to break down like how much money your business has generated income wise. And then right below that, it'll start to go into expenses for like travel, um, office supplies, meals, so on and so forth. What happens is they'll take your income, subtract the deductions that you're eligible for, and then go down to line 31. Uh, I don't know if it's that on 2020, but on 2019 and before, it's line 31 on the Schedule C that tells you how much you your profit or loss is in your business. So it's basically a form that reports to the IRS to let them know if your business is profitable or not profitable and then what deductions and income that you're claiming for this specific business. So I don't want people to get confused just because you're a sole proprietor doesn't mean you don't have a business. You just, your entity status yeah. is a sole proprietor. Okay, so I have a question. I'm, I keep talking while I'm on mute. Um, that whole, <laughs> the whole Schedule C, like you were breaking up a little bit, but what I want is maybe you oh, and nice. I, um, maybe you and I offline put something together real quickly so people can understand that. Um, because yeah. I always get confused when people say, you know, file for a Schedule C. So that would be oh, dope yeah. you can do that. Yeah. So <laughs> I had created a, uh, what is it called? Tax tip hack or tax hacks tax yeah hack. that sounds yeah. so weird. So what I'll do is just create a, a schedule C hack, and then yes. um, I'll turn it into something where it literally it will have the arrows and break down what a schedule C is. So that way That'd people be can have a better understanding of what it means. Yep. yep, and then I'll put it in my bio on my Instagram. Okay. okay. All right, let's rock out. You ready to move on? Yep. All right. 
people. I keep banging. Sorry. Uh, no, you can of a, a escort. So now we kind of have an idea of what are some of the benefits of an LLC. So I want to go into briefly about some of the pros. Of course, these are not all, but these are like the most common ones that stand out for people. So one of the pros for having an S-Corp is you won't be double taxed, meaning you don't pay self-employment tax, just like an LLC. And once we go to the next slide, you'll see another example, breakdown of what that looks like when you're an S-Corp. Another pro is recommend to switch over. This is another pro of it. So what I was saying earlier, it's recommended for you to switch over to an S-Corp once you're making at least 50,000. And the reason that is, is so... When you make $50,000 or more, it makes it easier for you to keep more of your earned income. When you make a little bit of money, it's hard for you to keep it because it doesn't make sense. It has to be reasonable. When you look at the IRS website and they talk about paying yourself and things like that, when it comes to being an escort, it has to be reasonable. And when I tell you that thing is so vague, it's it's ridiculous. Like, But you can't say that you make $100,000 and pay yourself $10,000. Right. That don't make sense to them. They, right. well, we know what you do for a living. That don't make no sense. You're trying to avoid tax, basically, and they know that. So you have to pay yourself a reasonable salary. And normally you can't do that until you reach that threshold. Okay. And if you are someone that is a, that has dependents, whether um, this is a whole nother topic, but it, dependence is not just having your children. Like, but just that's a whole nother topic. But if you do have dependents that are under the age of 18 that you do claim, the good thing about having an S Corp is you get to choose to how you, how much you're going to pay yourself. And the reason that helps in your favor is because when you have children, you're eligible for the, um, the child tax credit. And then whether you have children or not, you're, you're eligible for the earned income tax credit. But those are both based on, one, how many people you're claiming on your taxes, and then two, how much money you're making per year. So you don't have to have children in order or dependents in order to be eligible for the earned income tax credit, which is a, a credit that the government gives to you just for earning money and being lower income, technically. So if you are lower income, they try to give you a little boost by giving you a credit that is refundable to you. Um, if you have children, it's a little bit higher. They give you, but you have to have like a threshold. Like for example, um, it changes every year too. So if you have like two children, you can't make over like 40 something thousand dollars. The good thing about an escort, you knowing that and your tax professional knowing that they can give you that option. Like, hey, if you want to get this earned income credit as well as this child tax credit, you don't want to pay yourself more than forty five thousand dollars this year. So that way, you know, you know the game so that you can prepare yourself to get extra money back on your taxes. So which can help you just hacking the system. You just hacking the system, right? Exactly. I like it. And then right. another one is. It's a completely separate entity from you and your business. So that, that's another pro, just like with the LLC. So if something were to happen to your business, God forbid you were sued for any reason, guess what? You're protected. And it's your whole different layer of protection with an escort than it is with an LLC. So nice. even though there are some pros, there always are some cons. So always. always. <laughs> so one yes. of the cons for some people is you legally have to put yourself on payroll. Some people don't want to do that because they don't want to have to deal with the nuances that come with being now, quote unquote, an, a, an employer because you, you're responsible for paying certain taxes and uh, splitting some of the taxes with your employees in regards to like social security and things like that. So that's one of the cons. Um, if you are someone who is not considered a U.S. resident or U.S. citizen, they won't even allow you to be an S-Corp at all be taxed as an escort. Uh, this is okay. very important for people that are foreign nationals and things like that that come to do business here. They won't even legal, legally allow you to be an escort. I didn't know that. Yep. That's and dope. then um, another con is you cannot have more than 100 shareholders. So the reason they say this is because once you grow, you can really grow and be uh, an escort all the way up into having 100 shares, like 100 people. The goal is to scale your business. Now, whether you're going to get to 100 people in, in regards to your shareholders, neither here nor there, but there's some people that grow that, that rapidly. And so once you reach that threshold, that's it. They normally make you switch to becoming a corporation, which is taxed completely differently. Okay. Um, so there's a limit, basically. And the next one is the profit and loss need to be allocated to the specific percentage that the shareholder processes. So let's say, for example, it's you and uh, you have a business partner. Y'all decide that y'all want to have an escort. 
and um, your business partner owns 30% of the business and you own 50% of the business. So you can only allocate like the percentage. So let's say, for instance, your business makes 100,000. You decide to put y'all on salary for 50,000, right? Now you're splitting that 50,000 between the both of you, but you cannot pay John more than 30%. Like it will not legally allow you to. It wouldn't make sense that you're saying, John then made 50%, but he only owns 30% of a business. That doesn't make sense. So you can only, what that means is basically whatever percentage you're saying that somebody has stake in, in the um, business is the only amount that you can pay them out from the business. So if they only own 30% or 10%, they're looking to make sure that you're paying them the right percentage. So it's very important that you choose the proper percentages because when you're thinking about how I want to move my money, it can affect how you're taxed, how you move that money. So you have to be more strategic, basically. Makes sense. Um, another con is that the IRS looks at S Corps more scrutin like scrutiny. They they really comb through to make sure that you're claiming everything properly. Um, your K ones are in place. The K one is basically when your tax professional does your business tax return for your S Corp. They generate. It's called a K one. It's basically a statement. Um, that's given to each person that owns a stake in the business to say, this is how much you made as a shareholder. You report that or your tax professional reports that on your tax return. So it's basically like saying, I made this much income from my escort business. Mm -hmm. So basically they're looking at, they're combing through to make sure what makes sense on your business return correlates with on your personal return. Okay. And then the last one is less flexibility in allocating income and losses. So you don't have the same level of flexibility you do with an LLC, like picking and choosing how much you want to deduct, mm -hmm. um, rolling over some of your deductions to the next year. You don't get that with the escort. So it's a little bit more stringent. The benefit of it is you just pay less taxes than a self-employment person. So it's more so do I want to pay more taxes and have more flexibility in my business or do I want to pay less taxes but not have as much wiggle room in my business? That's really what you're debating between the two. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Very interesting. So if you go down to the next one, it's going to be the example that we were talking about. Yep. So same amount, you make net profit of $100,000. So now you are an escort. So what does that look like on paper? So you decide to put yourself on salary. It's just yourself. You pay yourself $60,000 in a salary, right? And so, of course, on that $60,000, you are paying a self-employment tax. And that self-employment tax is 15.3%, like we discussed before. Mm -hmm. Now, the 40%, what happens is that 40% stays in your business. So basically, it's uh, considered a distribution or called dividends. So basically, um, let's say, for example, if you ever had a bank account that had like high interest yields. So if you had like a savings account and you put you know money in your savings account, mm -hmm. if your bank saw that you made any money off of that interest, they send you a 1099 DIV. That DIV stands for dividends. So just like when your bank says, hey, you know, you kept $10,000 in your account the whole year and you accrued this much interest, they send you a statement. That's exactly what that is. It's a statement. Uh, That's the shareholders saying that, hey, you know, your business made $40,000, but they don't pay any self-employment tax on that money. Wow. At all. So I didn't know that. Yeah, that's why people love to do it because they're not double taxed as an escort. Wow. So the sixty thousand you paid yourself, you're on a W two. So compared to what you were as an LLC, paying fifteen thousand three hundred dollars, you're paying nine thousand one hundred and eighty dollars. So instead of you hmm. paying self employment tax on a hundred thousand, you're only paying self employment tax on the sixty thousand dollars you paid yourself. Which is why people go to escort. Yep, saves you thousands. You keep more, more of your money with the escort. Yep, okay. you just gotta have it set up properly. That's literally all it is. As long as you have a tax professional and a payroll person, yeah, you can really do this. Like, cause they're doing the work and you just paying them to do the work. Hmm. So okay. people do it because it saves them a lot of money, and then they can keep a lot of money in their business. Yeah, literally. So this is the financial organizing part. So this is what um. When you come to me and we do the business organizing, of course, it's way more in depth than this, but I wanted to like try to break it down into steps. 
So let's say that you're new to business. The first thing you want to do is step one, which is you want to choose an entity structure for your business. So we already went over what the five are. You have to just weigh the pros and cons of each and see what makes more sense in your business and where you are and where you're trying to go. Don't worry about just where you are. Think about five years down the line because most businesses crumble within five years of opening. We don't want that to happen. You want to think about the longevity of your business. So make sure you're choosing an entity structure that makes sense. Step two is open a business bank account. Now I have my EIN number. I chose that, hey, I'm going to be an LLC. Cool. Your next step is to open a business bank account. The reason is your money should not, your business money should not be separate. Mingling with your personal funds. It should not co-mingle. No, no, no. It's a no, no. When you try Reese, to start quick question. Loan, Reese, mm -hmm. quick question. When you do your, when you do the, um, when you set up your LLC, do mm -hmm. people know that, is it required for someone to get a business account? Do people know that, hey, when I set up an LLC, I have to go to the bank to open up a business account? Or do they just automatically assume they can use their personal for their LLC? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I never had yeah. someone that didn't know that they were supposed to open one. I know some people that were scared to make the transition and didn't know how okay. to. Okay. So okay. I knew everybody that came to me knew that they should have a business bank account, but they didn't know yeah. one, what type of bank they should choose or what they should be looking for when choosing one. And then they didn't right. know how to switch their money from coming to, like however, you know, people were paying them, switch it yeah. from their to their business. Okay. So that's where I came in to kind of let them like, hey, these are like five or six banks that do different things based off of, you know, what you want for yourself. Choose one of these. Once you open them, then we'll make the transition of funneling the money into this account. Is that part of your business planning? Yeah. Uh -huh. We're going to get to that too. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> So now your business uh, bank account is open, right? So the next step is download apps that will help you structure or run your business easier. So when we go through the business organizing, I kind of get to know what you do for a living because I have like 20 different apps. But certain apps wouldn't make sense depending on what you're doing for a notary than what it is for somebody with real estate. So, But I do have a couple of general apps that I tell people to download, like uh, QuickBooks. Um, it's very user-friendly, like with the app itself in regards to keeping expenses. Uh, tax bot bot that's a good one so it literally organizes everything for you i will say it's very tedious to initially set up once you set it up the moment you swipe your card the moment something hits your bank account it's like hey is this a business expense is this a business expense <laughs> you said tax bot tax, tax bot bot and then the other one is uh tax keeper is it keeper tax keeper hold on let me see. I think it's tax keeper. Tax keeper? Oh, keeper tax. I'm, I always say it backwards. Okay. Keeper. K-E-E-P-E-R and then T-A-X. So that one's good because once you link like your business bank account, if you swipe your card for any reason or something hits your account, it'll ask you if it's a business expense and it'll categorize it, categorize it what it is for you. You want to work smarter, not harder. Not harder. So now that you, you know, have these certain apps on your phone, cool. Now it's keeping track of your expenses and income for you. The next step is to set up insurance for your business. So not all businesses require insurance. Some, depending on what line of work you're in, some of them require you to have insurance and some of them is just, you know, optional. So that's why I say it's applicable. So I always tell people, I give like four or five different companies that offer different um, insurances. So basically like error and omissions insurance is very important, especially when you do things that deal with cyber, meaning like you sell uh, items or services online. It's important to have that because if for any reason your sy system is breached and it caused for their information to get hacked, if for any reason they sue you based off of some language or um, information that's on your website that's unclear and they feel like they didn't get the service that they were supposed to and decided to sue you, you have insurance. Just like if you were in a car and you got in an accident, guess what? You pay the deductible and you keep it pushing and your insurance pay the rest. It's the same thing with error and emissions insurance. They pay, you pay the deductible and they pay whatever the legal damages that come with that. Okay. That makes sense. And this is why, this is why I tell people too, with the whole E&O insurance, people get really confused on which which E and O insurance should I choose? Which company should I go through? I'm gonna tell you personally. I went through the NNA, but I next year when I renew, I'm gonna go through Byberk, right? So I think people okay. just have to research, yeah, the best E and O for them that fits what they're looking for. You don't necessarily have to go through the NNA just because they tell you to. I'm just I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. I, and I dealt with a couple of different notaries, so I give my clients yeah. a list 
Like, cause that's all, and then it also varies. It varies because of what state you live in. Yeah. So, like, what, what were my prices? Like, what I pay in Maryland for the same amount of coverage that my friend got in Tennessee? She paid double what I pay. So I know it's by state. That's when we found out. Oh, it's by state. So. Okay. Yeah, but I give you a list, but it's always up to the client. You got to do your research and figure out, okay, what does each one offer right. me? And then how much am I paying? And then outside of how much am I paying? Like how, what are their reviews in regards to processing? Mm -hmm. That's very important for you. So now that you have your insurance, your next step is to get with a tax professional to learn how, how you can set up for estimated tax payments. So like I said, Within the first five years, the IRS doesn't always necessarily think you're going to make money. Um, that's why they give businesses five years to have like profit and loss kind of, you know, be a little wonky up and down, but you know. don't go past five years because then it's going to be deemed as a hobby. If you take a loss for more than five years in your business. Hang on, Reese, explain what you mean on that with that whole five years. Cause you know, I was going to interrupt you. You already know. Yeah. What is that? What is so that? So basically with the IRS, so you have a business, yes. you start your business. Um, so literally they changed it. It used to be seven. I guess they went down to five. So within three to five years, five being the max, when you do your taxes, for example, your say for instance, your expenses exceed how much you made income wise. Now your business is taking a loss, right? Because you put out more money than you got in. You can only do that for up to five years without the IRS deeming, okay, this company is not making money. This is no longer a business. This is a hobby. Once they classify you as a hobby, it's dissolved. Meaning like you can no longer claim this on your taxes. So I always tell my clients, like, if you're getting close to that three-year market, I mean, five-year market, we had year three, I'm like, hey, next year, we need to start seeing some profit or claim less deductions this year so it doesn't look suspect to the IRS. Right. You don't want them to be on your, you don't want to be on their radar. <laughs> right? <laughs> At all. So if you start to make money, sometimes people make a lot of money and don't know what to do with it. Then when it's time to do taxes, so we all know normally, of course, they push the date back this year, but normally the IRS opens around January 15th of every year. Mm -hmm. So when you do your taxes, you have until April 15th to file, but you also have until April 15th to pay. Well, they give you to April 30th, really. You have to file by April 15th, but you have to pay by April 30th. So if you owe any taxes, if you don't pay by the end of the month, now you're paying late fees and penalties. Mm -hmm. what you owe. So okay. it's enough. <laughs> I tell clients, that's why, that's why I say, if you don't want to pay estimated tax payments, I can't make you. But if you decide that you don't want to, when you make money every single month, that needs yeah. to be a separate bank account where you're keeping 20% to the side to pay for estimated tax payments when it's time for you to do your taxes. So awesome. but if, you're, if you're someone that's not good at that and you want to have, you know, estimated tax payments come out, then guess what? We set that up with the IRS and with the state. Literally, all you do once a month is put how much revenue you made, and it'll spit out the calculator. Like you should be paying oh, us. Oh, that's beautiful. Literally, oh, that's awesome. Very, that's awesome. That's awesome. All right. So, step six is building business credit. So we talk about this on the business organizing. So I have an ebook that I sell, but um, with the business organizing, I give it to my business clients for free. So um, basically, what it does is literally step by step what to do to build your business credit using only your EIN number. It's very important that as you grow your business, you're not digging in your pocket to spend your own money. You want to be able to build business credit outside of your personal credit. So if anything goes wrong, only your business is affected and not your personal credit. So you're not a personal guarantor, but also building business credit so that you can get lines of credit for you know credit unions and banks so that you can pull money to help expand your business and pay for things that you need for your business. Like that's very important in order for you to be scalable. You have to have business credit in order to do that. You, you're supposed to use other people's money. That's how wealthy get wealthy. Hey, yeah. Hello. Yes. They don't use their own money. No. <laughs> of course, when you first start anything, yes. You use a couple of th thousand, right. hundred dollars. Pay but to play. You, pay to credit, play. you got to get another tax bracket. You got to play the game. And then uh, step seven, come up with a budget for marketing business essential startup costs. So if you're brand new to business, um, you want to talk to somebody that is in the field that you're in so you can get an idea of like how much money you're spending on fees to get started, how much your LLC costs to get started, how much you want to spend on marketing in order to get your business out there, those type of things. It's important to have an idea so you're not shelling out money immediately out of the, out the gate 
until you get enough revenue or until you get enough business credit. Like until you get one of those, you're coming out of pocket. It's, it's good to have a span or an idea of where am I at right now and how much money do I need to have in order to get to where I'm trying to go. I like it. So well, we that's like that. like a, that, well, that's the presentation. I had questions on the next slide of like what yeah. other people have asked me. So okay. um, you want to go through those questions or do you want to hit the, the comments? No, nah, we can hit the comments. All right. So let me. Oh, uh, wait, 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 I'm sorry. Go well, down no, to the blue slide. Actually, this is a question you and I. Oh, had. this is the one that I had. Yeah. So I will at least do that one and then we'll go to the comments. No doubt. So we were on Clubhouse the other day, and um, apparently, according to what you what she said that um, in your packet, there was a forty. It's a form number. So this is from the IRS. It's called uh, Form Four Five Zero Six. There's one that's a T for Tom and C for Cat. So the Four Five Zero Six T is the original IRS form used to request copies of your own personal transcript. So if you ever you know submitted a tax return to the IRS or if any wages or income or anything like that was reported under your social, it goes on a transcript to the IRS. So if you ever need a copy of it for yourself, that's what form you would use. Now, from what I understand in y'all packet, y'all got a 506C. And so that is a newer IRS form utilized to allow a third party to request a transcript of individuals tax returns electronically. So basically, if someone needs to pull your, your tax return to verify identity, verify income or whatever the case may be, they'll that's for the third party in order to do that. So the 4506T is great to use when you've lost certain um, income or wage documents for any particular tax year, or you need to verify what you reported, what was, what's been reported. So sometimes people be so gun ho to file their taxes, but they'll get something from the IRS saying that, hey, you didn't claim certain income. You pull your transcript, you can see what's been reported. And if something's wrong on there, I had one girl who company said that she got a, a W-2, but she had quit the year before. So I was like, how are you reporting that you pay right. me? You pay me. So like, right. that's important too. Um, yeah. And then the last point is that the 45060 is typically used by a banking or financial institution when they need to verify what you've provided to them for like loan purposes. So that's what the difference is between those two are. See, and I knew I wasn't tripping because I saw it in one of my loan packets that I had done. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, what in the living heck is this? I've never yeah. seen this before, but it's the same thing. So I just want people to know that, you know, in your loan packet soon that it will be replaced with uh, the C. Now, sometimes in your loan documents, you may get both of them because the person that's preparing the, the loan document don't know which one to put. <laughs> so they may, you may have both of them, just to let you know. All right. So let's get to the it's just for you to request transcripts for yourself. And the C that's is it. for a third party. That is correct. All right, so let's get to these questions. Um, the first question is with Sharice, so bear with me, Reese, while I get these people yeah. rocking. All right. Um, okay, so this is from, I don't know if we had this question already. So this is from Black Eyes. Um, actually not Sharice, so Black Eyes first. Um, let me put it on screen. Oh, that's cool, you can put it on the screen. Okay. I'm trying, uh, you know, I that's plan to get cool. better. I so at what level of <laughs> would you start doing estimated tax payment? So I would say fifty thousand, um, because really your first year, um, most of the time they don't expect you to pay estimated tax payments because normally your your expenses normally exceed how much you made your first year. Um, it's normally when you start getting into your three, four, and five that you hopefully are reaching a point in your business where you're making a certain level of uh, income. Um, at any point you can do estimated tax payments, but Normally, once you reach 50000 that's when you're getting into the thousands in regards to taxes that you have to pay. But, you know, if you still have the same level of deductions, like, you know, subscriptions, mileage, it can kind of offset that. And then if you have any other credits on your tax return, like if you're claiming dependents, if you have a mortgage, if you have school loans that you're paying off, there's other things that can kind of offset you owing. So one, I would say uh, 50000 And then two, it also depends on what else is going on your tax return. So I always tell clients, if you're not going to pay estimated tax payments, normally if you're claiming like one, two or three children, that kind of eats up the cost a lot. If you are um, paying any student loans or if you were in school, you get credits for that. So that eats up your cost that you would normally owe from your business. Or if you have a mortgage, um, any interest you pay on your mortgage throughout the year, they send you a 1098 form for it and you get credits for that too. So 
if you only solely have a business, you don't have dependents, you don't have a mortgage, and you don't have anything to offset this besides your deductions. Once you get to fifty thousand, you want to start monthly or or quarterly paying uh, estimated tax payments. Okay, one more from Black Eyes. Also, if you have a W two job that takes taxes out, does that change the level of revenue? Would you start level of revenue? Would you start doing estimated payments? Oh, okay. So I, if I'm working a nine to five and I make fifty there, but on my business I make fifty. Now you're trying to figure out if um, one has nothing to do with the other. Let me explain that. Your business income and what taxes you pay pay on that for self employment tax are completely separate from what you do for your W two. The reason being is your W-2, your employer is paying taxes on paying you. And then the taxes that you have from, you know, working at that W-2, like they take them out every paycheck, that's something completely separate. So the remaining still remains because your business is completely separate from your nine to five. Um, so one hasn't has, doesn't have anything to do with the other, if that makes sense. So it was still, in my opinion, I would start paying estimated tax payments once I reach a threshold of about 50000 Beautiful. Next one's Tiffany. Um, if you live in a state that doesn't have state tax, such as Texas, mm -hmm. what should you estimate your taxes to be 10% enough to just cover the federal tax instead of 18 to 20%? Yeah, I always tell my clients anywhere from 10 to 15, because one, it depends on how much you're making. So you can even Google, Google uh, federal income tax brackets. Federal income tax brackets. So... Let me see if it's the first one. Oh, or federal income tax rate. So you can either go to like uh, Nerd Wallet is pretty accurate, or you can go straight to the IRS website. We always tell people this is very important. Let me say this: anytime that you're doing something with the IRS, go to the website. <laughs> yes. yes, it's like Forbes and you know bank rate and all that. They normally explain stuff in more layman terms and friendlier terms. But if you want to be 100% accurate, go to the IRS website and go to the search bar and type in whatever you're thinking and then find the article because it's from the source. You can't confuse what's from the source. So yeah. on there, they do have an actual chart that they put out once a year. So um, I would say 10 to 15, if you want to be 100% sure, like, you know, for sure, I'm going to make 60,000 in my business. Go to the IRS website, look at the chart and based on how much you'll make, it'll tell you what your percentage is. Nice. All right. So for Martha, is it correct that notaries don't pay self-employment tax since they are independent contractors or can they elect not to pay? Nope. You can't elect not to pay. It's based on your entity status. So if you are a 1099 contractor, you're also a sole proprietor. So basically you are responsible for your state, federal, FICA and self-employment tax. When you start to change your entity status, like going into S Corp and or being taxed as an S Corp and things like that, when you elect to be taxed differently, then a sole proprietor, that's when you avoid paying that tax. Next question. All right. So Thrifty, I heard by a fellow notary that we can file public servant versus self-employed. So this, this is a debate. Um, with the public servant, though, you have to be certified by the government. That's not something that you can just elect to be. Like, you know how um, you ever heard like with student loans, if you are considered a public servant after you do a yeah. certain amount of years, they'll wipe out. But you yeah. have to be under certain categories to be classified as a public servant. Mm -hmm. So you can't just say, oh, I want to be elected as this. Like, no, it has to be a government entity that you work under to be certified as that. From my understanding, there is an application. Like if you're in a certain field, but your job title doesn't always fall in that field, you can apply. Yeah. But you can't normally, it has to be, you yeah, you can't just elect uh -huh. the They want to buy yourself, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So from Sonia, are you taxed higher when you are employed and run a business? It's a possibility. So, oh, hey. <laughs> I was like, okay. So um, basically your tax bracket is based on income, right? So basically if you made 60000 at your regular job, um, of course, minus your, you know, taxes and deductions. Uh, same thing with your business. After your taxes and deductions is based, it's put those two incomes together to figure out your your bracket of where you fall in regards to taxes. So it can affect you in regards to how much you're taxed, but it's normally after your deductions that they determine what bracket you fall under. It's not based on just how much you bring home in net. It's based on after your taxes, after your um your taxes are taken out of your W two. 
Nice. Okay. I didn't know that. All right. So the next one's from Lily. L How do you say that? I don't want to say Lily Ann. Lily Ann. I apologize if I'm killing your name. I apologize. All right. Is it Lily? Okay. Okay. So the question is, how does work when you rent an apartment for your business and second office? How does it work when you rent an apartment for your business and second office? So it's so, like she's using dual, dual, dual spaces. That's what it looks like. Okay, because I was about to say, are, is it is the office space an apartment? Yeah, how does it work when you rent an apartment for your business? Yeah, okay. that's what it looks like. So she has an apartment in the second room, and her in her apartment is her office, which is the second room. That's what oh, it sounds man. like. I have to find my laptop charger. My phone's about to. Ah! So basically, it's the same. I know, I know. It's the same thing that applies. So say for instance, uh, you if you're using the entire space on strictly only. Purposes, yes, it is tax deductible. If that business is not, um, if that office is not solely used just for that, then no, it is not. It's a percentage of the, the square footage that you use. So, let me give you a prime example. Let's say, for instance, um, that apartment is a thousand square feet, and then with that a thousand square feet, um, you only use 500 of it, and um, for the business, that 500 feet is what's put into the tax return, and it'll determine like for. The electricity, the water, the internet, how much that is deducted. But if the entire space is used, then the whole the whole bill is deductible. And the rent too. Makes sense. Um, and if we answer that question, Ms. Robinson, uh, if we did not answer the question, just please re uh, comment and then we'll answer. But I think I think we got it. Um, all right. So next question is Ms. Hudson, if I can't pronounce your first name, I'm just going to call you by your last name. So forgive me. <laughs> All right. So Ms. Hudson wants to know what is it? What is an 1120 S Corp? So basically, mm, excuse me. So when you do your taxes and you decide to be um, be a um, an S Corp, it's a whole. Remember, I was saying it's a whole different tax return that you do. So it's a it becomes a business tax return, meaning it's not done on your personal. So there's an 1120 for uh, regular C corporations. And then there's an 1120 S for S corporations. So it's basically just a business tax return um, based on your entity status. I'm just writing this down here, one second. Okay. That is, okay, okay. Next one is Marsha. I see, can you claim mileage and gas or is it one or the other? So this is particularly for, you know, loan signing and we're on the road or notary publics, right? So yeah. I've had that question myself. Can I do both? So you can either, it's a, when you do your tax return, it gives you the option to either do the standard, meaning like uh, basically you choose whatever the standard is for the year and they just apply that one flat rate. It don't matter how much miles or whatever you drove, or you can do actual. You can only do gas if you're doing actual. If you're doing standard, you cannot add gas. So if you tell your tax professional, I'm going to just go ahead and do the college. I don't want to, um, you know, go through all that. You can't add the gas. If you do actual expenses, it allows you to add gas. Lips a little okay. dry. Yes. <laughs> all right. I have a lot of questions, so I'm trying to get all of them. All right. So, Ms. Deborah, how are you doing, Ms. Deborah? All right. So this says, if you purchase supplies and certifications in 2020, but didn't establish your business until January of 2021, can you still deduct those items as a business expense? Not on your, I mean, if you do it, so this, uh, if then, then that type of scenario, that's what I call those. So if you plan to do your taxes this year for 2020 and include that business, meaning you already, uh, you didn't have an EIN, but you're doing it under your social. So if you're doing it under your social, you made income or you didn't, that's fine. You can claim those deductions on your tax return on a schedule C but your entity status would just be, I mean, your entity status would be sole proprietor and it'll have your social security number on there and not an EIN number. Then uh. next year, you do your business. You can claim other deductions that you occur this year, but this time it'll be under your business name and your business EIN number. So you can still claim it. You'll just be a sole proprietor and taxed as a sole proprietor. Next question. All right. Miss India, if you're tracking mileage for each trip, can you also write off your gas receipts? Yeah. So same thing. Long as you're not doing the standard deduction, then if you're doing standard deduction, again, you cannot. But if you are doing uh, actual expense, 
meaning you're putting actually the miles that you drove and you have copies and receipts of that, whether, you know, with the mileage tracker, um, and then you have receipts for gas, then yes, you can deduct that. Awesome. Um, so May just had a funny, she was like, I'm in North Carolina, so we can't charge travel fees. So she's like, I need to get an escort ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> On one of these other entities, yeah. Right, exactly. All right, I so that, let y'all do that. Huh? I didn't know they didn't let y'all do that down there. Yeah, there's there's a few states that um, don't allow travel fees. Like for us in New Jersey, there's no set travel fee that we can set. We can set whatever the heck we want to. You know what I mean? But there's certain states that dictate how much you can charge for travel. Yeah. Now you're gonna make me Google. It. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next question is from Beauty. Is there a time where you would opt not to use Schedule C? Would it hurt you to forego the Schedule C if the standard deduction is more than your actual expenses? There's no way for you to forego the Schedule C if you're if you're conducting a business. So you can't report it on a 1040. A 1040 is for like, um, so the 1040 reports all income. So if you're a W-2 employee, that goes on your 1040. If you own a business, that profit and loss can only go on a Schedule C. It can't go on any other schedules. So there's no really way to you to avoid it. Um, but in regards to the standard deduction versus actual expenses, Standard deduction only applies to, I'm kind of confused with her question because say for instance, if you are a W-2 employee and you have no business at all, there's a standard deduction based on your filing status. So if you're single, head of household, married filing separately or married filing jointly, right? So that standard deduction varies every year. Last year was uh, 12,500 for a single person, 18,500 for a head of household, uh, Mary filing separately, they treat you like a single person. And then Mary filing jointly, you get the biggest, which is like 24000 and some change. So those are standard deductions, meaning whatever money you made for the year, they deduct the standard deduction so they don't tax you on how much you make for the full year. They tax you after whatever's left over after the standard deduction, right? Okay. So that's the difference between those two. But if you decided you don't want to claim your business last year, you wouldn't have a Schedule C mm -hmm. at all. But if you decide that you want to claim your business, it has to go on a Schedule C and you can only take a standard deduction for certain things on that Schedule C, like the mileage, for example. Um, what's the other one? Your home office um, home office deduction space. You can do a standard or you can do the actual. So I okay. hope I answered that question. If not, she can react. Yeah, she can react. No worries. All right, so Ms. Depper again. So she has a question. Can you build credit as a sole proprietor? Yes, you may. You can, as long as you have an EIN number. So you can be a That's sole proprietor key. and uh, have an EIN number. So the EIN number has nothing to do with entity statuses. You can be an LLC, a multi-member LLC. It don't matter. Like, you can be a sole proprietor and have an EIN number. Your EIN number is what you would use. It's basically your business social security number. That's what you use to build your business credit. Okay. To, to, I guess, piggyback off of that, as a sole proprietor, does professional liability insurance provide any protection to keep personal assets safe? It's only for your business. Uh, well, let me rephrase. Unless it's uh, the... Sorry, they're shoveling outside. It threw me off. No, it's, it's, <laughs> they, it's um, snowing crazy here. Yes, it's snowing here. The E&O yeah. insurance will cover you, your business... Um, assets so if you were to get sued your business assets are protected but if you have an llc or anything other than a sole proprietor your personal assets are already protected they can't touch right. them under the so llc if you're, thinking, right. if you're if you're more so asking can you be a sole proprietor i actually don't know that one i know it for people that have llc's uh s corps so that's a good question we about to google it though you about to google it yep we'll come back to you all right, so the next question is, what is the pros and cons of doing a DBA? A DBA? Oh, doing business as. Um, yeah. Hold on. Insurance. She said sole proprietor, right? Yep. So while, she's, while, while Reese is looking up that answer, you guys, please make sure you follow her on all social medias. Um, Reese, is it pal underscore financial services? Or just yep. Powell, okay, so Powell underscore financial services. And if you're on Clubhouse, follow her, Queen, Queen Reese on Clubhouse. If you're not following me on Instagram, I am the Abnormal Notary. 
please follow me on Clubhouse. I am at everything tied. So holler at me. If you need an invite for Clubhouse, DM me. I got you. You ready, Reese? Yep. All right. So yeah, it does. So, but it says not all, meaning I guess you have to choose the right error and omission error in omissions insurance to cover your personal assets. So not all of them do that. Majority of them only cover your business, but it says it's depending on the uh the company. Okay. So yeah, just have to do your research. What are the pros and cons of doing a DBA? So the the con is there's no EIN number to it. So you can't build any business credit off of it. Um, it's more so a branch off of what you already have. So if you have a credit repair company and you call it ABC Credit Repair and you decide because what you're doing is financial and you want to do life insurance, you can do a DBA off that LLC and call it ABC Life Insurance. So it's separate in a sense of like on paper when you do business, like, yeah, OK, we have this, but I only have to have one LLC and one EIN. The con is if something happens with that DBA, it affects the, the parent company. And Which is LLC. Yep, and then it can affect everything. So it can be it can be good in regards to not having to spend a whole bunch of money to file separate paperwork to start a whole new business. It can be a downfall if something happens to it, or if you need to build business credit separately because you can't, because it's literally just the name on paper. That's all it is. Yep. That was a good question. Um, okay, black guys. Okay, so it looks like we have a correction on the question. I'm not asking for exact fees, but what should one expect to pay a tax preparer approximately? Oh, so, so she's looking at, yeah, go for it. Yeah. I'm sorry. So pay, I'm gonna pay the tax per, the person. Yeah. I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. So the, the lowest I've seen was 500 for a business. Um, personal taxes, I've seen anywhere from like 100 and up for a tax professional, but like business owners, 500 and up. I have one, uh, and then the tax preparer can, um, charge a fee based on your entity status. So of course, doing a sole proprietor in the LLC is way easier than doing an S-Corp tax return because then I'm doing two. I'm yeah. doing uh, technically three different documents. I'm doing a business yeah. return, which is your 1120S. Then I'm creating a K-1 for you to give to you to do your personal. And then I'm doing your personal taxes. So it's three separate things. So of course that costs way more money. It's more paperwork and more work to be done. Whereas with an LLC, it's all on your personal. So it can really vary per tax professional. Perfect. All right. So we have one from V Nice. We're all, we're going to be ending soon, you guys. So wrapping up. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments. All right. So this is from V Nice. EIN numbers is that assigned by entity? Meaning, if you have more than one LLC, do what? Try to get EIN numbers. Is that assigned by entity? Meaning, if have more than one LOC, do need more than one. Okay. I get what he's saying. Oh, I get what he's saying. <laughs> do you need multiple? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. For every LLC, you do need a separate EIN number. So, yes, every time you open a new LLC, it does require a new EIN number. Because, again, if you want that LLC to be attached to your EIN, your name has to match. If you decided, like I said, if you open an EIN initially as a sole proprietor and you decided, you know what, I want to go full fledged and be an LLC. If your EIN name is ABC Lending, your LLC needs to be ABC Lending LLC. That's the only way they'll let you keep the same EIN number and just change from sole proprietor to LLC, which technically you don't have to do much change because of the simple fact that you're taxed as an escort. I mean, as a uh, sole proprietor. But if you say, for instance, you start off as a sole proprietor. You decide to open an LLC and decide to do an S Corp being like you want it to be taxed as an S Corp. So you have ABC Lending on your EIN paperwork. Your LLC reads ABC Lending LLC, but you submit a request to the IRS like, hey, yeah, I have an LLC now, but I want to be taxed as an S Corp. So that entity number or EIN number can stay the same. But every LLC you open requires an EIN. So basically like a new social security number. Okay. All right. So the next one's on YouTube um, from India. I don't know if we answered this question or not, but it says, um, also, can we deduct car maintenance, insurance, car payment, and at what percentage if your car is used for business and personal? 50%. So, um, or if you're doing the uh, actual, it'll tell, it'll ask you how many miles you drove okay. for your business. So you have to put the mileage and based on the mileage, it'll do a percentage in regards to 
like we put in basically all the repairs and stuff you did to your car. But then once we put in the actual mileage, it'll use that calculation to determine how much of your your car repairs and maintenance are um, deductible. But if you have a business for um, a, a car strictly used for business only, you can deduct 50%, I mean, 100% of it. Okay. Just like with a cell phone, same thing with a cell phone. All right, so next question. Uh, let me just pop it up here real quick. So Lucia, no question is silly. You can ask any question you want. Uh, would you, this is the same question. Would you need to request a new EIN if you dissolve an LLC? I think you kind of no, answered that question. No, they're completely separate. So they're completely separate. Like when you file for your LLC, you do that with your state. They ask you for your federal EIN number because they just want to attach it to your LLC. But if you dissolve the LLC, you still have the EIN number. Okay. So you would just go back to being whatever you originally were. So that's Before. not a good Yeah. Yeah, that's not a good question at all. Okay. So let me get back to Sharice because I found out where Sharice was. She was in the private chat. So let me get back to her. Oh, okay. Um, I can't this, nobody can see this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's private. So Sharif says, how would the self-employment tax work for a notary as a loan signing agent? For a notary as a loan signing agent? Self-employment tax. Oh, okay. So it would... Uh, it would, I, would it be any difference? Susceptible to it? Yeah. Yeah, so if you don't have... um, If you don't elect to be taxed as anything other than a sole proprietor, that's what you're taxed at. Literally. So there's no way to avoid the self-employment tax unless you become a corporation or a multi-member LLC. There's no way to avoid it. Once you get into a multi-member LLC, S Corp or C Corp, that's when that kind of goes out of the window. You're not subject to the same tax as a sole proprietor. Mm. Good stuff. Bold multimedia. Sorry, join late. No worries. Glad that you're here. Hopefully this question wasn't asked already. I'm a new nerd and I was told, wait until I make at least 25000 before getting an LLC. So I'll jump on this real quick, Reese, and then I'll go back mm -hmm. to you. Me personally, if you're just starting out and you don't know if loan signing is what you want to do for longevity, this is your journey, this is what you want to do, I would say no. <laughs> uh, but if you are dedicated to this business, then you don't have to wait to get to a certain threshold. In my opinion, you can just go ahead and just create the LLC. Uh, Reese, what's your thoughts on it? Same. <laughs> okay. So yeah, <laughs> for the LLC, it's for me. Honestly, you can make and dissolve businesses. I think people are more so scared that once they start something, they can't end it, and that's not the case. Bis yeah. Corporations have been doing it for years. Like right. we, we used to go to the club, oh my gosh, in college, and then come back two weeks later, it's a whole different club because they right. just changed the business. Right. Like it's the same club, same owner, like same thing. It's a different exactly. name. So exactly. we as business owners, we have to get one thing. I want you guys to get comfortable with is getting out of the notion of, of being a worker. You yeah. have to think like a boss. What does your corporation think when they're making decisions and making cuts and making choices uh, in regards to the financials? Like you have to get out of the employee mindset and get into a mindset of structuring your business because you wear every single hat until you make enough money to hire somebody else to do it. All right. Next one. Um, and I think we're rounding up. I think this is the last one. So, Martha, thank you both for everything. I've learned so much. I look forward to future events. Awesome. Yay. Thank you so much. I'm glad this is helpful. All right. Yeah, so we're we're rounding out. So um Reese, let's let's give them some some gifts for joining. So let's talk about what you know what you want to give away to the people. And before you before you do that, I want to let you guys know something. A lot of you guys have hit my DM on the abnormal notary and in Instagram, and you're asking for gifts and whatnot. This is what I want to tell you. I could have 500 followers, which I think I do, something like that. God be the glory. 500, 500 followers, right? But if only 10 of those followers engage with me, I would rather have 10 followers than 500. So yes. in order for you guys to get these giveaways and to, to do all of this, I need for you guys to engage not only with me, but with Reese. And yeah, I'll be happy to give away stuff, but you guys have to engage and, and, and whatnot, okay? Enough of my spiel. Go ahead, Reese. <laughs> so, um, we, well, first we want to thank you for even taking time out of your Sunday. You know, I hope this filled your spirit up. I hope this got you, you know, ready and, you know, feeling a little bit more confident in some of the things that you were maybe not sure of when you started your business or now that you're in it and your feet are already wet. Um, you know, we don't take your time very lightly and I, I want you all to understand that. So we want to pick three people. Um, and what I want to do is offer a service. So if you go to my website, which is uh, www.pow, so Paul Oscar Water Financial Services.com, 
Um, my social media is POW underscore financial services. So if you go to my website, if you go to like the business tab, it has a breakdown of other services I offer. So like you'll see like PPP loan assistance and stuff like that. So the one that I'm giving away is called business organizing. So as I stated, some people, somebody's on here now because it's on my watch. <laughs> so somebody in Texas. So um, if you visit the website, it tells you what it, what it talks about in regards to what comes with the business organizing. So if you remember the financial organizing slide that we went through, we go over that and way much more. So basically helping you start your business, um, giving you advice on what you use, letting you know what websites to visit in order to get you started. Um, so some people are hands on, like they want to do everything themselves because it, it saves them money. So if you want to do it that way, I give you the websites of where you need to go in order to start it. Um, if you're somebody that you don't like, you look, hey, I'm going to give you my info and you do this stuff for me. You can go through me or um, places like LegalZoom or whatever. So that's the first step. Now that we have this underway, helping you choose a bank account. Um, once you have a bank account, helping you structure in regards to choosing what type of insurance you need to have for your business based on where you are. Um, outside of that, okay, we need to come up with a tax plan. Like, what is your goal financially? What are you trying to reach? Where are you at right now in your business if you already have, you know, established it? What to be looking for, like tax planning wise. Um, we go into marketing uh, opportunities. So what you should be looking for marketing wise. What can help you if you're on a budget, how to stretch that budget as far as possible to get your name out there. Um, we talk about motivation. Like one thing, this is so important to me. The first 30 minutes of my day, I'm listening to motivational. I listen to Les Brown, Tony Robbins, Will Smith, uh, yes. Nicole, Lisa, Eric Thomas. Like when now that you are in business, you're going to have great days and you're going to have horrible days. It's important that if this is what you want to do, you have to have the, the mental toughness to get through what it takes to be a business owner. So like not only am I giving you these tools, but I want to help you stay motivated in your business that like it takes years for people to be successful. This is not an overnight thing. Right. Yes. You went to school, get a high school diploma. It's no different in business. It's not an overnight success. And um, anytime you do anything overnight, it crashes. So we don't want, we don't want the slow and steady to win the race. Okay. Um, yes. And then outside of that, like structuring your business, like when you're ready to scale and decide that you want to add employees, what does that look like in your business? So marketing, um, insurance, structuring your business, tax planning, bank accounts, like it's so much more. If you, I'm probably I should probably look and quote it directly from my website, but, <laughs> but it's a good idea um, what we're talking about. But it's more so getting to know you, getting to know what your goals are, seeing where you are business wise, and helping you structure to make sure the foundation is solid. So as your business continues to grow, and business credit, that was the other thing, um, helping yeah. you establish business credit. But like once you grow, like you want it to be solid. You want to be able to yes. be standing on a firm foundation so that you can get where you're trying to go. So. Normally no. that service is $150 um, and it's about an hour session. At the end of the hour session, I give you a PDF document of everything we went over. So you have something to reference back to because it's a lot of information. And then also giving you my ebook that's free for the uh, building business credit. So we're going to give away three of those. Um, and if you don't get it, like don't hesitate to, you know, still reach out if you need the help. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm still here either way. Yeah, no doubt. So this is what I want. Like I told you guys in regards to engaging and whatnot, hit my DM. Um, I will get with Reese and, and she will work with you to get those amazing gifts. Now, this is what I'll tell you. Um, actually, hang on one second. Reese, so they're asking where to sign up on your website. Do you want me to pull it up real quick so I can direct people? Oh, yeah, you can. What's the, what is it? POW financial yeah, services. Services. Yeah. So, okay. so what I was going to say was um you have to dm ty and then uh, a number we're going to choose numbers yeah. so the people that the three people that are closest to the number will get that service for free so the number is between one and 100. choose any number between one and 100 and the three people that are closest to it not over it but closest to it meaning below it at that number or below will get that service Perfect. Can you see my screen? Yep. So that's my okay, website. Sure. You go to uh, book online on the top. And then if you scroll down, it should be on the second part. Business organizing. Yeah, virtual business organizing right in the middle. Right here? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So this is it right here, right? Yep. 
So if you click on it, it kind of just gives you all a little bit of background of what to expect on the call. It's about an hour long. Um, it is a Zoom call. Unless you're in the Philadelphia area, we I have an office so you can come. Um, but I do come to Maryland too, off and on. So if you are in Maryland too, I can schedule a time to meet you in person. If you're a visual, like if you like to meet people in person, that's fine. But um, if not, then it could be a Zoom call. We just go over and get to know you, get to know your business, see where you are. So that we that way we're hitting the ground running. And then once we're finished with the call, I send you a synopsis of everything we went over, give you a PDF breakdown of how to organize your business and then as well as build business credit. Perfect. Okay, so let me stop sharing. All right, so Reese, you and I have to get together. Um, yeah. Ooh, I like these numbers, yes. <laughs> these are awesome, freaking amazing. Um, I'm gonna take a screenshot, actually. Please, I would love to see. <laughs> huh? <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, this is awesome. Did, uh, one time before Streamyard. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I really like it, actually. All right, so we are we are at the bottom. We're at the <laughs> we're at the top of the hour. I appreciate every single one of you joining this live event. Reese, I am humbled that you came onto the platform to share your amazing knowledge. So I appreciate you, Queen. Um, yeah, so we'll get back with you. Like I said, the 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 um, our social medias. I've already plugged them into the comments. Make sure you follow us. <laughs> Put the the way. Way. Yeah, yeah, go Put for it. The numbers. Okay. Put the numbers in her DM. <laughs> yes, put them in my DM, you guys, because once I end this broadcast, I, I'm gonna lose it. it. Yeah, yeah, I'll probably be on the yeah, because it's live comment, so it won't carry over. So, so just DM me, you guys. Okay. Um, the next thing, just to let you know, we're gonna end is my next live event is going to be with Lori Brewer. Okay, she is over the TNT Tuesday Titans, so she will be coming on the Abnormal Notary Show February the thirteenth which is a Saturday. So make sure it's open and she's given some amazing giveaway. So that's it. Reese, do you have anything else to leave these amazing Kings and Queens on um, the show? One thing I learned in business is to ABL always be learning. Yeah. Uh, you can never know too much. Even people that are at the top are always trying to figure out how do I stay here? No matter what information you are presented, always do your research and always, always, always check the facts. Because we're Amazing. all, yeah, and like I've always tell everybody that either joins my clubhouse rooms or have seen me on these events, sharing is caring. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the more information that you know, the more that you can inspire somebody else. So just keep it abnormal, like I always tell everybody. <laughs> I love all it. Right. <laughs> awesome. All right, that's it, Reese. I appreciate you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hit my DMs with your numbers, and we will get back yeah. to you. Thank you so much. God bless all you. Right. Thank y'all. Have a good night. All right, see you.